Welcome to the mid-19th century, where strict rules of fashion govern the proper display of grieving for a dearly departed loved one. Queen Victoria's great sadness over losing her beloved Prince Albert in 1861 plunged her into mourning for the rest of her life. Additionally, the American Civil War, which began that same year, was a time of great loss as well. Today, I am getting dressed in a mourning ensemble, representative of what may have been worn in the early 1860s to mourn a close family member. That is, all in black. I personally lost my mother a few months ago, and I've worn this ensemble to portray a widow in the past, so I felt the time was right to share it with you today. A knee-length chemise of white cotton serves as the most basic undergarment. It is easy to wash and protects the outer layers from body oils. The black silk ribbon woven through decorative beading gives a nod to the nature of the layers which will go on top. Each leg of the drawers is sewn to the waistband separately, leaving the middle completely open. Shocking, but necessary, as the numerous layers on top will soon prevent removal of the drawers and nature calls to even the most delicate maiden. These are cut full and their trim echoes that of the chemise. Drawers are of white cotton as well and therefore easily laundered. The chemise may be worn outside of the drawers, especially if an under petticoat is not worn. But the chemise may also be tucked into the drawers, which is my recommendation in warmer months as the chemise will help absorb moisture and make walking much more pleasant. Remember to put your shoes and stockings on before your corset. Long black silk stockings extend over the knee and will need to be held up with garters. These garters are knit in black wool and are long enough to wrap around the leg twice before being secured with braided ties which end in a delicate tassel. Black leather boots modestly cover the ankles and must be fastened with the help of a button hook. By placing the hook through the hole and grabbing the shank of the button, then turning the entire hook in a circular motion, the button can be drawn easily through the tiny hole. With some practice, this can be done rather quickly. This corset is a single layer of white cotton coutille cut with gores to add shape. It is stiffened with a wire that has been twisted into tiny overlapping circles known as spiral steel. This allows the corset to bend in easily at the waist and is quite comfortable and supportive to wear. The front opening busk, which hooks closed with loops and studs, allows the corset to be laced behind, but put on in front. It should need only a gentle tug to tighten and tie the laces in back. The corset is not meant to lace completely closed. A small gap allows some flexibility where the strings crisscross. The way to get a small and tidy waistline is to have a solid base so that the woven fabric of the bodice can wrap as tightly as possible around the torso. The corset is an essential support garment not only for the lady herself, but for the many skirts that go on top. It is a protective garment that distributes the weight of the full skirts, preventing them from digging into the hips. Some hoop skirts are composed of channels sewn into a fabric skirt, but this one is in the form of an open cage. Concentric hoops are held in place by vertical tapes which keep the rings in place. Each casing holds a solid strip of flexible steel, making it strong enough to support the weight of the skirts, yet flexible enough to bend readily, which helps it collapse, making it easy to sit in. The panel of fabric at the bottom helps prevent a foot from accidentally being stuck through the rings while walking. At least one petticoat layer is needed between the hoop and the dress. The ruffle at the bottom helps soften the line of the skirt as it falls over the edge of the hoop beneath. Multiple tucks are a common decoration on petticoats of this style. The black silk that threads through the trim coordinates with the other undergarments. Mine is on a drawstring to accommodate a variety of waistlines, but a waistband would have been more common. Wearing more petticoats gives the skirt a smoother look, but they do add weight and warmth to the ensemble, so each lady must choose for herself depending upon the occasion. This basic black cotton dress could be worn in a less sorrowful context, 
but here it is paired with accessories, which are the true indicators of mourning. Removable black cuffs and a collar of lace are tacked into the dress before it is put on. These items would normally be white, so this is one way that you can tell that a dress is meant to indicate mourning versus simply being a fashionable black dress. It buttons up the center front with beautiful intricately cut buttons, and the full sleeves gathered into the tight cuffs also button closed. Details such as piping at the waistline, collar, and shoulders are common for dresses of the 1860s. Tiny cartridge pleats are individually sewn to the waist of the tight bodice. A black silk belt on an oval buckle covered in black velvet adds a touch of subdued fashion. The buckle is purely decorative, so the belt is pinned tightly in place. This brooch I created from various buttons is meant to look like jet. Jet is a black gemstone which was popular for mourning jewelry. It appears to be intricately cut and coordinates with the buttons. These earrings are also meant to look like jet, but with cameos engraved upon them. Perhaps the silhouette reminds me of my dearly missed loved one. My hair is braided and arranged in a low, neat bun, which perfectly accommodates this simple black straw bonnet that ties beneath the chin with wide ribbons. The net veil on mine is theatrical in that it allows me to easily see and be seen through it, but a true Victorian widow in mourning would have a thicker veil designed to shield her face in public, probably made of black crepe. Crepe is a material made of twisted threads and is particularly good at not reflecting light. Crepe may be worn on other parts of the ensemble as well to further emphasize the state of mourning. Black leather gloves are worn for modesty as well as sun protection and are a must for any lady when leaving the home. Handkerchiefs are usually all white, but this one is specially designed with a strip of black to indicate mourning. A fan composed of black wood sticks and painted paper with silver etching displays a simple gray and white design. This one is actually based on an 18th century fan, but is similar in style to Victorian fans. This is an actual antique carriage parasol that I recovered in the same fabric and style as the original. A ribbed black silk file canopy with simple ruffle. Its wooden handle is painted black and it folds in half, so it can be easily tucked away. The top portion of the canopy also tilts to the side to accommodate a lady riding in a carriage who wishes to block her window. We are at last dressed for the day. A widow may want to leave her home as little as possible, especially during the early stages of mourning. But women like Queen Victoria, who spent half her life in mourning, had an empire to run. So eventually, life must go on. The topic of mourning customs and clothing is a vast one I have only given you a small glimpse of today. I will leave links in the description of where you can learn more and also information about each of the items I presented. Thank you for joining me. May you cherish each day while keeping alive the memory of those you love.